Lord be with you. you. That's a rather short prelude. It's just indicative of how fast time flies. And we're kind of finishing up, well, not kind of, we're finishing up September, taking a turn at the end of the church year, and uh, Pumpkin Fest is coming up, and then Thanksgiving, and oh, you know the rest. So it's moving along pretty fast, just like that prelude you did. But it's also a red letter day in uh, more than one way. We got the Bell Choir debuting, yay, looking forward to that. And we're de- debuting as well, new communion wear. Thank you, Linda Young, who is on top of that. So it's veiled, and those of you especially who like to take the common cup, you're back in good graces. So we'll uh, be able to do that. And uh, we even have one person giving a tribute with the use of the common cup today. Uh, a tribute, that is, to Dick Malkey, who uh, drank out of the common cup. And uh, now, who knows what extent of glories he's experiencing up in heaven. That's something we all look forward to. And uh, as well, I look forward to today's service, worshiping with you, and we we begin with our opening hymn. Please rise for that. Awake my soul and with the sun. God bless your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Lord God, grant us peace each day and assure us the salvation of our souls at the end of our days. Lord God, grant peace to the world in our time, health and strength to Christ's church in your wise guiding, and growth toward unity for all brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, have mercy, forgive our conditions, and give us this day our daily bread. Lord God, bless this holy house, and hear the prayers of all who offer their worship and praise. Lord God, help us now, save us for heaven, comfort us in adversity, and defend us from all evil. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we know that our Lord calls us to be patient and content with the gifts he has given us, to be at peace with one another, and not to let sin get in the way of our following him. But like those who came before us, we impatiently complain, quarrel, 
and allow our weaknesses to lead us into sin. Therefore, we now confess our sin and ask God for mercy and grace and forgiveness. We begin with the silent reflection in our own hearts. Almighty God, we stand before you with all those who have gone before us complaining about your provision, who prided themselves in their earthly possessions, but ignored the poverty around them, and even with the disciples who thought they were the privileged few who could work for you. The Holy Spirit was poured out on you at your baptism. God has worked faith in the heart of every true brother and sister in Christ. You are children of God. Therefore, by your faith in Jesus' redeeming work for you, all your sins have been forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for a hymn of praise. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for this, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, is selected verses from Numbers 11. Now the rabble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, 
Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a nursing child, to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once, if I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And the young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his earth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson comes from James 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord.
Amen. That was all praise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Bill Choir. And we also honor our Lord Jesus by rising for the reading of the gospel. I invite you to rise at this time. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the life crippled than with two hands to go into hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. May be seated as we also dismiss our children for Sunday school and sing our hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I've been pondering for several weeks just how I might approach our gospel for today. And I found that I need to take a rather roundabout path to get to a point of understanding about sin. Let's start where God does with the wonders of creation. 
back in Genesis. In Genesis, we witness the Lord acting to put in place the entire universe. And it's a standalone move that happens through his word. After he sets everything in place and in motion, the Lord decides to get his hands dirty, so to speak, as he molds Adam from the clay that he had already made, purposing Adam and then Eve as his special creations, modeled after himself. He even breathes himself into them, imparting his Holy Spirit as he brings them to life. God is so intimately involved with his special creation that when they fall into sin, he puts into motion a plan to restore them and ultimately us by becoming one with the clay and then taking on the punishment that sin earns for every one of us. You know, amazingly, when you think about it, God doesn't appear to care a great deal about the act of creation itself. I mean, you look at the entire breadth of the Bible, he only spends a couple of chapters in Genesis, a few verses in Job, and a small number of psalms reflecting upon the vastness of his creation. But in contrast, look at how much Scripture is focused on the crushing burden that sin laid upon his creation. And then God's plan of redemption, his way to reverse the damage that sin had caused and to set things right again, thus restoring everything that was lost because of the fall. The redemption arc begins in chapter 3 of Genesis and builds throughout the rest of the Old and New Testaments along with almost continuous depictions of the sin, repentance, and restoration that move through the lives of God's people. This two-pronged theme of sin and redemption is found modeled in the lives of the patriarchs, expounded in the law, and pondered by the prophets. You know, we've seen a little bit too much of the damage of sin lately. We've witnessed the damage wrought by wind and rain, fire and flood, all of it reflecting the devastating fallout from the original sin perpetrated in the Garden of Eden. And as we look around, we see homelessness and drug addiction are becoming ever more increasingly prevalent wherever you care to look. You can see all sorts of evidence about the damage of sin involving shattered lives, shattered reputations, shattered privacy, shattered promises, shattered hope. The brokenness is evident wherever you look. As we turn to the Gospel of Mark, we are reminded that Jesus has been giving his followers a reality check. I mean, he had been relentlessly teaching about the kingdom, sometimes disguising his meaning by using parables that tease out various elements of what it means to take part in the kingdom. In Galilee, it informed his disciples that the Son of Man was soon to die and yet would be raised again on the third day. He let them mull over that earth-shattering news on the journey back to the more familiar territory of Capernaum, and events during that trek revealed that his disciples still had a great deal to learn. So, setting the scene, we see that the twelve, as they had been walking along the way, had been arguing among themselves about which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom. They all thought that they were on a fast track to glory, a benefit of living in Christ's shadow. Jesus asked them to join him for a private meeting, pulling them aside to find out what was going on. 
And they sheepishly confessed to what they had been doing, and Jesus began to teach them in the simplicity of God's spiritual economy that if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all. The greatest shall serve the least. He beckons to a little child, and while placing that child in their midst as an object lesson, teaches the disciples that reaching out to such a little one in Jesus' name is evidence of being connected both to Christ and to the Father. And so we pick up the narrative as it goes along in Mark 9, and immediately John tries to change the subject. Entirely missing the point about radical servanthood and the kingdom, he says this, Father, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. John is still burdened by the things he is trusting in. He's fixated on that power argument that they had been having, still wanting to be the authority who would decide what could be done in the name of Jesus, and then by whom. Part of the problem is that he and the other disciples were still smarting over a, that recent incident where they were unable to cast out a demon from a young man. They didn't want to see anyone else being able to do that. Jesus humbled them in that instance, and yet they still squabble about greatness. Jesus sets John and the others straight. Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. See, the whole point is the kingdom. Anything that works toward advancing God's purposes, even something as seemingly insignificant as sharing a drink of water, is valuable to the cause. More to the point, you don't lord it over others because they lack the proper pedigree or social status. You certainly don't try to stop someone from doing good things in the name of the Lord. The one who is not against us is for us. Next, he poses the kingdom in more personal terms, using more jarring images crafted to grab attention, images that causes one to ponder just what he's getting at. First, pointing to that young child he had previously set in their midst, he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Boy, talk about a burden. That is a stark description of utter destruction. Working for God's kingdom brings rewards, but working against it brings condemnation. Harming a believing child spiritually is definitely something you'd want to avoid. God is perfectly just. And sin such as this most assuredly requires judgment. That idea leads to this, as Jesus continues with, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter a life crippled with then with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What do we make of this? Jesus often employs exaggerated language to make his point. And once again, the point is the kingdom. 
In other settings, Jesus had expounded on the surpassing value of the kingdom, relating it to such things as a lost coin or a pearl of great price. In those parables, to find that coin required total effort. And to possess that pearl cost everything the man owned. Here he makes it personal. What would you be willing to give up in order to gain the kingdom? What would you pay to avoid that choir, that fire that is not quenched? According to Jesus, these things may require more than a mere pound of flesh. His words are hard to hear, but there is no cause to pull out the paring knife just yet. Unless, of course, you're planning on gaining the kingdom all on your own, then all bets are off. You're doomed before you start, and no amount of pruning can possibly trim all of that excess weight of sin that you continue to accumulate. It just doesn't work. There is good news. Where your hand or foot is causing you to sin, Jesus had his hands and feet nailed to the cross in your place. Is it your head that gets you into repeated trouble? Jesus bore a crown of thorns on his brow in your stead. Does your heart lead you astray? Jesus took a spear thrust in his side for you. He took on the whole burden of your sins and mine, past, present, and future. He bears the awful load of our transgressions, paying for it all through his death on the cross. He promises to give us new hearts, to renew our minds, to raise us up to newness of life in the resurrection with perfected bodies, unmarred by sin. And so here we are. We regularly come together in worship and praise to make confession and to hear Christ's promise of redemption, to receive his body and blood given as a token of his presence with us and of the great deliverance he has provided for us. Thanks be to God for giving us a place to bring our spiritual burdens where we are able to lay them at the altar and go away unburdened, freed from the guilt that so weighs us down. In response, we are called to be salt in this world. Salt in the time of Christ was a preservative and a purifying agent. The Word and the Holy Spirit are also spoken of of being able to purify and preserve believers as living sacrifices, acting to display God's power and grace, hence the admonition that everyone will be salted with fire. In Luke 3, when John the Baptist was teaching about the coming Christ, he said, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We are baptized, changed by water in the word, adopted into his kingdom. And just as salt can bring life to bland food, our changed selves are enabled to witness in word and deed, pointing a lost and darkened world back to life and light. So as Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Live in the sure hope that Jesus works in you and through you to preserve you to the end. Lay your burdens upon Jesus, pairing up with him, and find true peace now and forever. Amen. Amen, indeed. Problem of sin resolved in Christ. And we get to declare that victory in the church's creeds. Today we'll do it in the the, uh, words of the Nicene Creed. Please rise for that. 
I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father for all worlds. God of God, I am light, very God, very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us sin, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the Lord of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. Please be seated and we'll continue our worship with the offering. Please rise for the offertory.
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Lord, remember, we pray, your holy church. May your holy angels watch over her and guard her. Grant her peace and unity throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Remember, too, our church leaders nationally, Matthew, our synodical president, Michael, our district president, and all pastors, teachers, school teachers, and all servants of your church. Strengthen them in the true faith and enable them to teach it well. Lord, in your mercy. Remember our governmental leaders, our president, our governors throughout this land, all public servants, and all in our armed forces. Guide, bless, protect, and uphold them in honor. Bring all nations in this restless world into the ways of peace, we pray, and into the ways of justice. Let your kindness and love grant seasonable weather and abundance as well for those who are fighting fires and other natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy. Remember all who suffer for your name, all who are in prison, the hungry and ill-clad, the poor and the lonely, those who travel, and all who cry out to you in their time of need, especially all who have asked for our prayers, including those that we name in the silence of our hearts even now. Lord, grant them your holy angel to be with them always that the evil foe may have no power over them. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, your son instituted his holy supper for the forgiveness of our sins. Give us humble hearts to receive this blessed sacrament with thanksgiving and strengthen us through the same for our daily lives of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Everlasting God, you have ordained and constituted the service of angels and men in a wonderful order. Mercifully grant that as your holy angels always serve and worship you in heaven, so by your appointment they may also help and defend us here on earth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And we'll start with the offertory prayer as we get into the next section. Receive these gifts, these symbols of time, abilities, and resources that we offer you, Lord. We place at your complete disposal in thanks of your eternal grace, mercy, and peace. Receive them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is indeed good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to him, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, 
he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Christ given unto death for all your sins. Please rise for the post-communion canticle. O Lord, that we who have received with our lips, we may keep with our pure hearts. We thank you that through the gift imparted to us in this present life, we have received life everlasting through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his everlasting peace. Amen. May be seated for our hymn, our closing
special welcome to visitors that we have today. We invite you to get some coffee down the steps, grab a cookie or other nice things that people bring out there. You never know. Some great surprises. And uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, this week, we uh, had a nice send-off funeral for uh, Dick Malky, and Saturday, we're going to do it again. But for Ellie Zoykosi, that's going to be at 1 o'clock uh, right here in the sanctuary, and light, light reception after that. Um, any other announcements? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I can kind of reiterate. Oh, calendars. All, all right. I can hear people going crazy for them outside. They can't wait for those calendars.